Great, so um, by way of introduction, my name is Monica Ortel. I'm one of the folks on the PL legal team. I have a background in IP. I've done a little bit of patent prosecution, a little bit of litigation, kind of everything in between. So super excited to be exploring this topic with everyone and just figure out you know, what kind of changes we can make and how we might be able to make some things more efficient. So as you can see, um, my talk is on tinkering with the patent system. So it'll be on a survey of various patent reforms. So first I'm gonna start about working within the legal system, talking about a few things that people have done in the past to try to optimize for various things, which um, has traditionally a lot of times been for speed, uh, speed of getting things out the door. Um, and then I'm going to talk about one mechanism, how people have worked outside of the patent system with prizes to try and incentivize um, certain behaviors, you know, without kind of the patent dance and patent litigation and, and the holdup that that might cause. Okay, so starting with the law-abiding folks, um, there have been a lot of reforms that have been made within the patent systems of the world, and you know this has some benefits because, like a lot of these systems, are generated so they can be very like globally interoperable. Um, for example, you know keeping like patent terms the same as other countries, etc. Um, but of course, the drawback is that it's very slow, and if it's really slow, if you make a a change and it doesn't work, you know, it might take you a while to sort of reset and sometimes optimizing for one quality will um, negatively impact other qualities. So the first slide I have up here is the AIA, a big change that went into effect for patents in 2013. Um, and one thing that happened there was changing from first to invent to first to file. So interesting change because it did create some efficiency and not having to like go through inventor notebooks and always say, you know, who put this first on a napkin in a cafe? Um, but it created this like race to the patent office as well, um, which might have some negative in incentives too, like filing a patent when you're still figuring out exactly how it works, um, which is kind of a no-no, like in the spirit of the, like in the actual letter of the law, but I think people do it anyway. Um, the other thing I wanted to quickly touch upon was like the idea of utility patents. So you can see you have these in China and in Germany, oftentimes shorter duration, meant to be for fast moving te um, tech fields. They often have a much faster publication time, which is probably great to you know, try to monetize, get things out there, and also spread sort of innovation into the world so it can be compounded upon. But the problem is that oftentimes um, they also have lower substantive requirements for review. And so um, Germany and China both have these systems now, Australia, interestingly enough, had this innovation patent system, and I found out a few days ago that it was very short-lived, actually. <laughs> um, they basically found that they had these, I think, maybe something like five to eight year long patents with basically not a lot of substantive review. They could kind of be challenged down the line, and you could like file innovation patent and then a normal patent and then like elect the normal patent later so you have kind of longer protection from like the beginning. Um, but they found that people were using these to create these massive patent thickets because they would just say, well, I'm gonna file here, I'm gonna file there, it's not really gonna be reviewed, let's just create like this massive swarm of patents. So I thought this was an interesting case study because they actually were really reacting quickly to this and you can see that this was only in effect for really a, a year and a half or so. Okay, and then um, over to the next side of things, kind of working outside of the patent regime, um, prizes are one mechanism that I think has, they've been around for a very long time. Um, the two examples I have on the left side of here were both from the 1700s. Um, the probably most famous example was the Longitude Prize where British Parliament wanted to, you know, create ways for people to accurately measure measure longitude that didn't result in so many ships being lost at sea. Um, in the middle, um, canning as well, that was Napoleon in the late 1700s trying to feed his armies and canning methods of preserving food actually are still used today. And on the right, I have billiards. Um, these were originally made in ivory, which even in the late 1860s was becoming scarce and obviously much worse now. And the prize money awarded to the first cellulose-based billiard ball, some people credit that to like the modern discovery of plastic. So some really great examples in the past, um, obviously still used today, but I'm gonna jump ahead of those. Um, so I think that there are some you know, differing incentives um, between prizes and patents, and one of the first ones I wanted to talk about is just who's dictating innovation, and how can we frame prizes in a way that you don't just have like a centralized small group of people controlling the purse. Um, maybe that's 
crowdsourcing things, maybe that's having bounties, maybe that's opening it up and, and you know, allowing more people to sort of dictate what might be important. But, you know, that is one thing that I think is important to think about when you're structuring prizes, like who's making the calls? Is there a gatekeeper issue? But at the same time, um, when you're putting out an affirmative prize, rather than just focusing on sort of market rewards of, I have a patent, I want to monetize it, you can also have prizes that are more public good. So like, I think it's kind of good and bad, and, and there are ways to sort of tailor this. Um, the other thing, um, time-based incentives, you know, there might be some kind of different mechanisms there. Patents are first to file, so you're incentivized to move really fast, whereas prizes might um, be structured in a way where people have more time to kind of perfect innovations and get it to like really a working market model and you're having to compete against other teams as well. Um, so there are some really interesting things to think about there. Okay, moving to, oops, sorry, moving to the next slide here. Um, what happens to the IP? And this is something that I think is really important here too because, you know, there are prizes that don't have any IP provisions, prizes where the, um, the person sponsoring the prize gets the IP. Um, and then there's also like patent buyouts where maybe you say, you're not going to get a patent on this. This is just going to be a publication and you've gotten your prize money. Um, and I think that's really the best for like making sure that you have like rapid dissemination of innovation and can build upon that. But you do have some sort of um, like lost incentives down the road from, from like being able to, you have like the information asymmetry between how much you think a patent or an invention is worth and how much it actually is worth in the market based on what's happening kind of downstream. Um, and then also um, you can see I have this graphic, private versus public institutions. There's a lot more private prizes, but there are some uh, public prizes as well. And especially with those, I think it's important, um, you know, if taxpayer money, money is going to those prizes, um, having no IP restrictions at all could cause a kind of double taxation problem. Okay, and, sorry, I'm losing my mouse here. Um, okay, and then this is kind of what I was starting to like think about a little bit this week, and this is a like very like stripped down sort of where do, your, where do you spend money, where do you gain money, what are some of the differences, and how can we make things more fair and sort of like equitable over the lifetime of the technology. Um, so, you know, you can see that like with patents, you have a little bit more of an upfront cost with prosecution. You also have litigation, pro litigation costs. But I think with patents, they incentivize kind of like heightened rents over time um, because you are basing your price based on like how much the other party has to lose in litigation. Um, and so you kind of get that like compounding effect over time. Whereas with prizes, you know, if you have like a patent buyout or something that's in the public domain and you can't license, um, you might have this also negative incentive of like, how are we pricing this fairly and bridging the asymmetry between how much we thought this was going to be worth versus how much actual impact. So I know like, impact assessment has been something that a lot of people on the team are really passionate about and this is kind of where I think it falls in. Um, maybe you have, you need, maybe you need to, you know, give someone like a prize or a bounty so they have enough money to like bring it from this initial prototype to a market product but then also long term, how do you incentivize people to want to engage with that system? So, you know, maybe a, like a short term prize, long term impact assessment, there's some good ways to kind of optimize there. So anyway, those are my thoughts and I would love to open it up for questions.